To listen to Killer Psyche ad-free right now, join Wondery Plus by starting your free trial in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. When I was a young girl, I think 12 or 13, I remember having posters in my room of each of the four Beatles. I loved their songs. I had a record player in my room and I would listen to their music for hours. And I'll admit, the poster of John Lennon was my favorite. Until I found out he was married, his poster got the most love. Years later, I was a nursing student at the University of Illinois. It was 1971. And John Lennon's song, Imagine, was released. It is by far, was then and is now, my favorite John Lennon song. I think I like it because of the concept of a world without violence, a world without war. The song didn't mean as much to me when it came out in 1971 as it does now, 50 years later. I look back and I can understand why it means so much to me having spent my career surrounded by violence and murder. Rolling Stone once described the song Imagine as John's greatest musical gift to the world. I agree. For generations, people have revered it, kind of as a battle anthem for peace. But not everyone agreed. Some religious groups were outraged by the lyrics, especially when John asks us to imagine there's no heaven. Radio stations called for boycotts of the Beatles and Lennon in particular. Some churches even held album burnings. But one man, Mark David Chapman, took this really personally. He couldn't believe that John would say such a thing. Even more upsetting to Chapman, though, was what he perceived as Lennon's hypocrisy. His lyrics spoke of having no possessions, and yet John was pictured on yachts and surrounded by obvious wealth. Mark felt that Lennon was leading others astray and that it was his duty to stop this from happening. And there was only one way to make that happen. He must kill John Lennon. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It's difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Mark David Chapman, the man who killed John Lennon. Mark David Chapman idolized John Lennon, but there was someone else, another figure that he felt spoke directly to him. That was Holden Caulfield, the main character in J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. Holden symbolized the rebelliousness and disillusionment of youth for generations of young people. He gave voice to all of their angst and uncertainty. I have not read the book in a long time, but I do remember that Holden's emotional state becomes increasingly fragile as he tries to remain true to himself and keep his childhood innocence in a world that he says is full of phonies. Mark believed that he must protect the people of the world, especially children. In his mind, Lennon's lyrics and public musings and interviews seemed anti-Christian and hypocritical. To Chapman, John was therefore the biggest phony of them all. 
In October of 1980, 25-year-old Mark David Chapman borrowed $5,000 from his father-in-law, and he flew from his home in Hawaii to New York City. He had one mission, to rid the world of John Lennon. Just a few days before his flight, he quit his job as a security guard, and he bought a gun. Ironically, he was afraid to bring bullets with him on the plane because he thought that was too dangerous. He decided he would buy the ammunition in New York City. But what he didn't know is that New York law barred citizens from buying ammunition, civilian citizens. Once he arrived in Manhattan, Chapman spent days casing the famous apartment building, the Dakota. It's on the Upper West Side of New York, and that's where John Lennon lived with his wife, Yoko Ono. But he still needed those bullets, so he decided to take a plane down to Atlanta to see a friend of his. His friend was a local deputy sheriff, and he told his friend that he needed bullets for protection. So his friend gave him five hollow point bullets. Those types of bullets expand upon contact with the target. That makes them damage more tissue and therefore much more deadly. With bullets in his hand, Mark flew back to New York intent on completing his mission. But while he was waiting for the right opportunity to kill John, he saw a movie called Ordinary People. In that movie, a very young Timothy Hutton plays a suicidal teenager from a highly dysfunctional family. That struck a chord with Mark and helped him to rethink his idea of killing John. He called his wife Gloria and confessed to her what he'd been up to, what he had been planning. But he told her that he had come to his senses and had defeated his inner demons. He flew home to Hawaii the very next day. Unfortunately, John's newfound clarity didn't last long. It was soon replaced by an even stronger desire to kill John Lennon. Two months later, fueled by his obsession, Mark David Chapman flew back to New York City on December 6, 1980. The night before the murder, on December 7th, Mark laid out all the things he considered important in his hotel room. His passport pictures of him working with Vietnamese refugee children, a picture from The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is wiping the cowardly lion's tears, and a leather-bound Bible. Inside the Bible, he had changed the Gospel of John to the Gospel of John Lennon. In the early morning hours of December 8th, Mark was hanging outside the Dakota apartments. All day he waited there, just hoping to get a glimpse of John. There were other people around, fans of John Lennon, and they hung around the front of the building as well, just waiting for John and Yoko to appear. The couple had just released a new album, Double Fantasy, so Chapman had a copy of his own. He bought it so that he would blend in with the crowd of John's fans. Most of the fans that were gathered there were regulars, and they knew each other. They noticed the new guy, Mark, and tried to include him. What did they do? They introduced him to John's little boy, Sean, as he was leaving the building with his nanny. Mark actually shook his hand and called him a beautiful boy. That was probably in reference to John's song of the same name. Now that we know what actually happened, I find it terrifying that a soon-to-be killer who was psychotic actually touched the child of his target. Around 5 p.m., John Lennon finally appeared outside the building. Mark was so starstruck that he did not pull out his gun. Instead, he asked John to sign his album. John was polite and signed it. He even asked Mark if he wanted anything else before he got into a car and went to a recording session. When Lennon left, Chapman says that he tried to get himself to leave. He asked one of the other fans to go out with him, and he begged another one to stay with him. He thought that would help him not complete his mission. However, when John got back from the studio later that night, Mark was still there. John walked right past him on the way to the building. Mark then pulled out his gun, aimed it at John, and fired five shots. Four of the bullets went into John's back and shoulder. 
the doorman, and this is incredible, raced over and knocked the gun out of Mark's hand, and then he kicked it away. What did Mark do? He calmly sat down, took out his copy of Catcher in the Rye, and waited for the police. Inside his book, the police found the words, and I quote, this is my manifesto. And Mark signed it, Holden Caulfield. When the police arrived at the scene, probably within a minute, they realized John did not have time to wait for an ambulance. So to save him, several of them carried him into their police car and took him to the nearest hospital. But the hollow point bullets had done their job. The ER doctor who treated John said that when they opened him up, all of the vessels going in and out of his heart were completely destroyed by three of the bullets. There was nothing they could do to save him. Mark had completed his mission and John Lennon was dead. We get support from Overland, a family-owned American heritage brand that puts comfort and quality first. Overland started over 50 years ago in New Mexico, and they use expert craftsmanship to pair the highest quality merino sheepskin with supportive memory foam midsoles to make slippers feel better and wear better for longer. Let me tell you right now, there is nothing I do every day that is comfier or more luxurious than slipping into my new pair of Overland sheepskin slippers. It's like walking around my house with two pillows on my feet. They're made of true double-faced sheepskin, so the suede you see outside is the same piece as the fluffy sheepskin you feel inside. It's lighter, more breathable, and there are no synthetic materials touching your feet. Overland offers 100% satisfaction guarantee, and their commitment to customer service is exceptional. So don't wait another day to slip into something way more comfortable. Get the best, highest quality sheepskin slippers on the market at overland.com slash psyche. You'll get free shipping and free returns. And I recommend you go today because these slippers are so beloved, they've been known to sell out. And don't forget, Christmas is coming. That's overland.com slash psyche. One more time, overland.com slash psyche. What compelled Mark David Chapman to murder one of the most famous musicians of the 20th century? Mark was born in Texas in 1955 but his family moved to Georgia soon after when his father left the Air Force. He was taking a job in Atlanta as an engineer. Mark's mother was a nurse. He also had a sister, her name was Susan, and she was seven years younger. According to Mark, the whole family lived in constant fear of their father. He was physically abusive, especially to Mark's mother. Friends reported seeing him actually beat Mark with a closed fist. I always wonder if somebody is that bold to let other people see them doing something horrible, what are they doing in private when no one's watching? When he was very young, Mark felt that he had to be an emotional and physical guardian for his mother. He relayed a story of his mother running into his bedroom once. She was naked, terrified, begging him to protect her from the father, pleading with him to beat the dad up. What does that kind of thing do to a child? He's being terrorized. His mother's being terrorized. Well, he's a little kid, so he feels helpless. He's also confused. Wait a minute, I have to protect mom, but adults are supposed to protect kids. What's going on here? All in all, it was highly traumatizing for him. Growing up, Mark was bullied at school and was considered a loner. His friends were the ones he created in his mind hundreds of thousands of tiny, microscopic people that he believed, or imagined, lived in the walls of his bedroom, and he was their king. He created an entire world for his little people, and when they were good, he'd put on concerts for them. He would play his Beatles music records over and over. He had little figurines, little army men, and he would stage them to represent the four members of the Beatles band. He pasted paper guitars on them, and for Ringo, he even crafted a miniature drum set. However, 
When his subjects were bad, he had an imaginary button on the sofa where he could kill off groups of the little people, and he did this as punishment. But in this make-believe world he created, no matter how many of his people he killed, they always forgave him. A lot of children have imaginary friends, but marks were so real to him that they became a part of his everyday life, even into adulthood. This is a phenomena known as a paracosm. A paracosm is an intricately detailed imaginary world that develops over time, starting when the creator is a child or adolescent, and it can continue into adulthood. This imaginary world has its own rules, its own geography, history, and sometimes its own language. It will usually include parts of the creator's life woven into the fantasy. And of course, that makes perfect sense. Paracosms can be helpful as a creative outlet for artists, scientists, and writers. For example, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. But for others, it's a coping mechanism that occurs after a child experiences trauma, neglect, or abuse. According to child psychologists, those children can fall back into a previous stage in their development to a time when they felt most safe. A paracosm is similar, the goal being to step out of reality because reality is too difficult to process. Sometimes these imaginary worlds interfere with reality and the creator does not know what is real and what is not. Mark's little people helped him escape into a world where he was a leader, where he was in control, literally, of life and death. Makes sense, doesn't it? Little children who are being abused are unable to do the two things they want to do the most, subdue their abuser and leave the situation. Mark also used drugs and alcohol to cope, which is not at all unusual in abuse victims. The very first time an abused kid uses drugs or alcohol, their world changes. They feel a sense of calm and escapism they've never known, an inner peace that they probably will seek over and over again. But as we know, repeated alcohol and drug use can change the course of a healthy brain development. By age 14, Mark was skipping school constantly and his use of marijuana evolved into heroin and LSD. At one point in his teens, he even ran away and lived on the streets of Atlanta for two weeks. When he turned 16, Mark did a complete 180 and became a born-again Christian. This is also not unusual for young people in an existential crisis. It's kind of like, I give up. I can't control reality, but maybe a spiritual entity can do it for me. I just have to surrender. Put your life in God's hands and everything will be okay. Mark took a variety of jobs with the YMCA. This is where he discovered he had a passion for working with children. He found them much easier to deal with, to interact with, than adults. In 1976, 21-year-old Mark joined his then-girlfriend at a Christian college in Tennessee, but he cheated on her, and the incident left him overwhelmed with guilt and feeling both depressed and paranoid. Not even his love of John Lennon and the Beatles could break him out of it. Another thing that gnawed at Chapman after he became born again was John Lennon's comment back in 1966 that the Beatles were, quote, more popular than Jesus. Mark considered this blasphemous. His friends even noted that Mark's anger was way over the top. It's safe to say that at this point, Mark had become a religious fanatic. That can be very dangerous for anyone or any institution who was in any way seen by the fanatic as worthy of God's retribution. Killing someone in the name of God's glory is perfectly okay to the fanatic. After dropping out of college, he went back home and began working as a security guard. But his depression did not let up. So Mark made a plan to go to Hawaii. It was there he would spend his life savings and have a really good time and then kill himself. 
It was while he was in Hawaii in 1977 that Mark attempted suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. But the hose he attached to the car's exhaust pipe melted and his attempt failed. He was saved by a passerby. But it was a very serious attempt and he was admitted to a local hospital for clinical depression. After his release, he began to work at the same hospital in the maintenance department. But he didn't stay long. Within about a year, Mark, who was now 23, booked a trip around the world. He did this through a travel agent named Gloria Abe, a woman that he eventually would marry just a couple of years later. It seemed, for a time, that Mark had conquered his depression. But in fact, he had a serious mood disorder and it was controlling him. Mark now had a new job as a printer at the hospital and his office was in the basement. His wife said that his paranoia and rage started to emerge again and that being isolated down in the dark office was not helping him. He was soon fired from that job and landed work as a night security guard. By this time, he was drinking heavily. Gloria reported that Mark could be violent and aggressive with her. He would grab her legs tightly and his anger seemed to always be present. Mark had intense mood swings. At times he was exuberant, then he would quickly become suicidal. This is a pattern we see in people suffering from bipolar 1 disorder, also known as manic depressive type 1. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder. It causes dramatic mood swings and shifts a person's energy, their mood, and ability to think clearly through no fault of their own. When they are in a manic high, they have little to no control over their behavior. The mania, also known as hyperactivity, and depression are far different from the way a typical person would experience the ups and downs of daily life. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, there are four main types of bipolar disorder. This is how they define them. Bipolar 1 disorder involves periods of severe mood episodes from mania to depression. To be diagnosed with bipolar 1, a person's manic episodes must last at least seven days or be so severe that hospitalization is required. This form of bipolar is dangerous to the patient and those around them. When a person is in a bipolar storm, a mania storm, they hardly get any sleep. They may sleep two hours a day, and then they're constantly talking, constantly moving, constantly going. It's dangerous. It's dangerous for them and dangerous for those around them. Bipolar 2 disorder is a milder form of mood elevation involving milder episodes of mania. It's called hypomania, meaning the mania is there, but it's not severe. And that alternates with periods of severe depression. People with bipolar 2 can function much better in society than bipolar 1. The third type of bipolar disorder is called cyclothymic disorder. It is a chronically unstable mood state, and when someone's experiencing it, they can have hypomania, mild depression for sure, for at least sometimes a couple of years. People with cyclothymia may have brief periods of a normal mood, but these periods last less than eight weeks. The fourth type of bipolar disorder is called other specified or unspecified. This is when a person does not meet the criteria to be diagnosed with bipolar 1 or 2 or cyclothymia, but still has experienced periods of clinically significant abnormal mood elevation. There also is bipolar disorders with psychotic features. This means that in addition to the mania, the person is having hallucinations or hearing voices or both. This is a very serious situation and the individual should be hospitalized and medicated until what I call the storm is over. I know all of this is really heavy stuff and it's sad and it's scary, but there is treatment and the treatments are effective. They consist of medication and therapy. And as I mentioned, hospitalization is sometimes necessary as well. But it's important that someone with these disorders stay on their medication. It's common to believe 
okay, I'm having a problem, a medical problem, a psychiatric problem. I don't feel right. I'm not acting right. Oh, okay, here's medication. They act fast. When I was a psych nurse, it took three weeks for medication to help. Now there are medications that can act in 48 to 72 hours. However, what happens is the person starts to feel better. Their depression lifts or their mania becomes under control. And it's normal to think, well, I'm better now. I don't need the medication. In fact, they do. They need it forever. Studies have shown that one of the strongest factors in the cause of bipolar disorder is genetics. This accounts for 60 to 80% of patients. Most family members do not develop the condition. It is just that people with the disorder frequently have a relative with the same condition. Concussions and traumatic head injuries that result in traumatic brain injury can definitely increase the possibility of developing bipolar disorders as well. Environmental factors such as major life changes, high stress, and even the change in seasons can exacerbate the symptoms of depression and mania. And finally, heavy drug and alcohol use and lack of sleep can be a strong trigger of symptom emergence. In all my years as a psychiatric nurse, I've encountered this. Everything I've studied in this case leads me to conclude Mark David Chapman was bipolar one with psychotic features. Let me break that down. He was suicidal. He had rapid mood swings. He had over-the-top anger and agitation, which certainly is an indication of a manic episode. And he made major life changes. Now, that's not always a bad thing. We know that. But in his case, he did it without any concern for consequences or any effect. People experiencing a bipolar mania have a lot of trouble sticking to a plan. An idea comes into their head, they like it, they embrace it, and it goes out just as quickly. Another behavior of Mark's that pointed to bipolar mania was his growing list of obsessions, including buying expensive artwork and going into debt to do so, and then, almost just as quickly as he bought it, to sell it. These symptoms were also apparent when it came to his obsessive reading and rereading of The Catcher in the Rye. And it was that book that ignited Mark's rage. And the effect that had on Mark during a bipolar mania cemented John Lennon's fate. There are other mental health issues that Mark is suffering from that we will discuss in a bit. But everything that I've studied on this case makes me conclude that Mark is suffering from bipolar one disorder with psychotic features. As a psych nurse, I've seen this a lot. Most people who suffer from bipolar mania do not have delusions or paranoia, but Mark did. Mark said his rage over John Lennon's song, God, made his mind go, quote, through a total blackness of anger and rage. According to his wife, Gloria, he felt that John was laughing at him when he sang in the song, Imagine, about having no possessions when John was a millionaire. That is paranoid thinking. When most people hear a song, they might feel they can relate to it, but Mark thought the song was about him. This is known as ideas of reference. The individual with the mental problem thinks, for example, a commercial on TV is speaking directly to them. And so when the person says, right now, stop what you're doing and call 1-800, the person suffering from this might actually do that. That's what was happening to Mark. He thought the lyrics in John Lennon's songs were directly to him. Chapman says that he knew he needed to consult with his little people and ask for their advice. So he said he called a board meeting with them and they advised him not to do it. He then began to have delusions that there were actual demons possessing him and they urged him on. And they were the ones that whispered in his ear, do it, do it, in the fatal moment that he shot John Lennon. When he was diagnosed after his arrest, all six of the psychological experts assigned to his case agreed that he was psychotic, meaning out of touch with reality. Five of these same experts diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, 
We talked about this kind of thought disorder in episode 11 of Killer Psyche and how Richard Chase, the vampire killer of Sacramento, also suffered from it. And although both Chase and Chapman suffered from delusions, the disorder manifested itself differently in each of the men. The sixth psychiatric expert disagreed with the other five and thought that his symptoms were more consistent with bipolar depression. I think Mark is a mixture of the two, and here's why. As I mentioned earlier, it's clear that Mark was definitely bipolar, bipolar one, but he also had psychotic features associated with the illness. It's more rare than simple bipolar, but I've seen it many times, and it's dangerous. After his incarceration, Mark believed that he was possessed by demons, demons that had made him kill John Lennon and put the angry thoughts in his head. He believed this so strongly, he had a priest stand outside the prison walls and perform an exorcism. Mark claims to have actually felt the demons coming out of his mouth and claims to have heard them talking to him. These types of delusions are also consistent with the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. The person believes on some level they are bad and they are bad because they have demons inside them. One other thing that struck me was something that Mark's biographer, Jack Jones, said on a Barbara Walters special on Lennon's killing. Quote, if wanting to be remorseful counts, then I think he is the epitome of remorse. But whether he actually feels that in the overwhelming sense that one of us might feel if we realized that we had done something utterly horrible, I'm skeptical. In that same special, when Barbara Walters asked Mark, what would he like to say to Yoko if he could? He answered, this is what I want to say, Barbara. Please understand I was not killing a real person. I killed an image. I killed an album cover. He went on to say, I think about her healing. That's remorse. I may not sit there and ball all day, but I'm thinking about her healing, about how she is doing, how she's making out. Interesting, he never says, I feel horrible about that because he doesn't feel bad. He doesn't truly understand what he did was wrong. He may say the words, but he believed he did the right thing. He points out that what he said indicates remorse, but it doesn't. It does not at all. He's not a psychopath. Psychopaths are of sound mind. Psychopathy is a personality disorder. Mark David Chapman had a thought disorder, and his thoughts were woven into the fabric of his being. When Mark made his final trip to New York to kill Lennon, he seemed resigned to his fate. He tells us he did not want to do it. He is angry at others for not stopping him, his wife, the other fans, the photographer. But Mark says even if they had stopped him in that moment, he would have had to kill John eventually. He said that he even prayed to Satan to give him the strength to pull the trigger. That was his purpose in life. He needed to rid the world of phoniness and protect the innocent. And he only could do that if he killed John. Mark believed that once he completed the murder, he would literally become Holden Caulfield. This idea was so real to Mark David Chapman that he attempted to change his name legally. That's not quirky thinking or quirky behavior. That's delusional thinking. In fact, Chapman had planned to hold up a copy of The Catcher in the Rye and shout to the crowd, I am Holden Caulfield, the catcher in the rye of the present generation. In his first statement to the police, given hours after his arrest, Chapman stated, I'm sure the big part of me is Holden Caulfield, who is the main person in the book. The small part of me must be the devil. The news of John Lennon's murder shocked and angered the world. Security had to be increased around Chapman for all court appearances and psychiatric evaluations. He was kept at the high security jail on Rikers Island in New York. In fact, his first court appointed attorney actually quit. He was concerned about the multiple death threats that he was receiving simply for representing Mark. While in jail awaiting trial, Chapman was given extensive psychological evaluations. 
he was more compliant with the prosecution's evaluators than his own attorneys. One psychiatrist thought that this was because he did not believe he was crazy and felt the defense doctors were only saying that because they were paid to do so. After six months of extensive evaluations from more than a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists, three from the prosecution, six for the defense, and several appointed by the court, Chapman was finally declared fit for trial. Mark was charged with second-degree murder, and at his first hearing, he pled not guilty by reason of insanity based on the recommendations of his attorneys. They were confident that he would be found not guilty by reason of insanity. But Chapman shocked everyone by telling his lawyers to drop the insanity defense and plead guilty to murder. His lawyers objected and legally challenged Mark's ability to make this decision. At a subsequent hearing, Chapman stated that God had told him to plead guilty and he would not change his plea or ever try to appeal. His lawyers disagreed but said that Mark would not listen to them. The judge then refused to allow further psychiatric evaluation, saying that Mark made his decision of his own free will and declared him competent to plead guilty. On August 24, 1981, Mark David Chapman was sentenced to 20 years to life, which is five years less than the maximum. The reasoning here was that he had pled guilty and saved the courts the time and expense of a trial. But that did not mean he'd be free after 20 years, only that he would be eligible for parole. The judge also ordered that he be given psychiatric treatment during his incarceration. That tells me the judge clearly understood that Chapman was compelled to commit the murder of John Lennon because of his mental illness. There are some that feel that Mark's main motive for killing John was to achieve notoriety and fame. After all, Chapman later admitted that, and I quote, I was an acute nobody. I had to usurp someone else's importance, someone else's success. I was Mr. Nobody until I killed the biggest somebody on earth. I don't think that is the main motive for his crime. I think it's something he came up with years later and he liked the way it sounded. He liked the way it fit. Mark David Chapman has been denied parole 11 times since 2000. He is considered to still be a dangerous threat to society. There is no curing a paranoid schizophrenic with his extensive history of the illness. It can be treated, it cannot be cured. Mark comes across as very calm, that he's being thoughtful, that he is appropriately emotional, that he is now a rational man who can look at his crimes and see what he did wrong. I don't think so. When I see him in these interviews, I think he's simply medicated, fully medicated, and that is why he appears this way. If Mark were to be released, I don't think anyone could guarantee that he would remain this way. His next parole hearing is set for 2022. It is my hope that for all of us, including Mark David Chapman, that he is denied parole once again. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll be covering Betty Broderick. If you don't want to wait, you can listen to it right now and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Maxwell Carney. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are our production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. This series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Music